morning. I would like to welcome you to the book discussion of Dr. Helen Kim's Raised for Revival, How Cold War South Korea Shaped the American Evangelical Empire. My name is Kwok Kui Lan, and I teach theology at Kendra School of Theology at Emory University. Today's event is jointly sponsored by the Kendra Foundry at Kendra School of Theology and the Emory's Graduate Division of Religion. We have the director of Kendra Foundry, Dr. Ryan Bonfilio with us, and I would like to invite him to introduce the work and ministry of Kendra Foundry. Wonderful, Dr. Kwok, thank you so much and greetings everyone. It's so good to have you all gathered with us this morning. For some of you, it's very early morning if you're on the West Coast, so I hope you have coffee in hand. For others, we're approaching lunchtime and in either way, we're so glad to have you. I have the honor of working at Candler School of Theology. Um, both as a colleague of Dr. Helen Kim, just down the hall from her, uh, and I teach Old Testament here at Emory. But in addition to that, I also direct this new initiative called the Candler Foundry, which in a nutshell is trying to make the best of what typically happens at seminaries high level engagement with scripture, theology, ethics, church history. We wanna imagine how to make that more accessible and engaging for people who probably never will go to seminary. We wanna take the seminary model and turn it inside out. And instead of just inviting other people to come to us, we wanna take seminary on the road and out into the community, into public spaces, whether they are congregational spaces or other places that people gather. And we do that in a number of different ways. One of them are through these monthly webinars that Dr. Kwok has so uh, graciously convened for us. And we love to have these conversations around really important projects and books that our faculty are doing. But we have other ways in which we seek to engage the public in in-depth theological learning. One of them uh, is a program called Courses in the Community. These are uh, seminary level courses, but instead of being designed for people who are enrolled in our degree programs, they are designed for people who are not in seminary and they are taught out in the community and in intentionally engage issues that are connected to the questions uh, and problems facing local communities. Uh, we host about 40 of these a year. And if you're interested, we would love to have you engaged either as a teacher in our courses in the community program, or if you think uh, you would like to bring a course to your community, we would love to be in conversation with you about that. Uh, another thing that we do that's relatively new uh, is an eight month online certificate program that offers specialized training in micro credentialing in various areas of theological reflection and ministry. We have launched two tracks in this program, Essentials for Biblical Interpretation and Peace Building and Conflict Transformation. And we are hosting cohorts that are working through these eight month online tracks as we speak, we have new tracks coming online soon, including one on youth ministry and another on trauma-informed care. So again, we would welcome having you all engage in this content, teach with us, uh, partner up with us. We are very interested in, in thinking of this broader initiative as something that uh, crosses across lines and boundaries uh, and into the community and with various different constituencies. So there's more to say about the Candler Foundry. We're going to put the website. Uh, it's already there in the chat, so you can check out more information about the Foundry. But for now, let me turn it back to Dr. Kwok and this wonderful panel that we have. Thank you very much. Uh, today's uh, panel uh, will run like this. First, I will invite uh, Dr. Kim to introduce her book, followed by remarks by the four panelists. Unfortunately, uh, Dr. Uh, Christian Domey had a scheduling conflict, but she sent uh, beforehand a pre-recorded video for her remarks. And after hearing from four uh, panelists, uh, Dr. Kim will briefly respond before we open to questions from the participants of this Zoom meeting. Please put your comments and questions in the chat. And I want to uh, remind you the event will be uh, recorded. And now I would like to introduce Dr. Helen Kim to all of you. She is my colleague and assistant professor of American religious history at Kendra School of Theology. 
She studies U.S. religion and history in global context, focusing on U.S. religious connections to Asian Pacific and transnational histories of Asian American religions. She's the author of the book that we are discussing today and co-author of Family Sacrifices, The World Wills and Ethics of Chinese Americans. She has received teaching awards and research grants to support her teaching and scholarship. Dr. Kim. Thank you so much, Dr. Kwok. And thank you everyone for attending today. I know we're on Eastern Standard Time, Pacific Standard Time, but also some people who are in Singapore and India. So we're global here. Um, I'm so excited for our time today. Um, special thanks to Dr. Kwok Quilan, um, the Candler Foundry, Emory's Graduate Department of Religion, who are all hosting today, as well as to the panelists, um, Corey Tucker Price, Peter Choi, um, Tom Steed, and Kristen Dume, who we're going to she had to run out to DC to be interviewed by Al Jazeera on white Christian nationalism, which is important. So we're gonna bless her in her work, but I look forward to her comments on the video. Um, I wanna introduce the book by uh, first sharing that the seed questions for this book emerged from within the Korean diaspora, as I talk about in the preface. Um, when as a college student, now about two decades ago, um, I began to ask questions at the intersection of religion and inequality. I pursued these questions in graduate school, which led to this dissertation turned book project. Um, Race for a Revival tells a trans-Pacific and what one reviewer called sobering history of how late 20th century evangelical Christianity hardened into a tradition of heart and hierarchy when stripped of its social conscience through war, empire, racism, and a theological commitment to individual conversion as the primary means for social transformation. The book works at the intersection of the history of American religions and Korean Christianity, as well as to the backdrop of the Cold War in Asia incorporating literatures of Asian studies and Asian American studies. So the project is functioning at the intersection of these four fields. Um, in addition to the preface, introduction, and conclusion, the book consists of five body chapters. The first is titled Martyrs, War, and World Vision. It begins in 1950, and the book runs up to 1980. The second chapter is Students, Immigration, Conversion, and White Fundamentalism. The third chapter is Orphans, the Mirage of Evangelical Diplomacy. The fourth chapter is Revival, Billy's and Billy's Largest Crusade. Fifth chapter is Explosion, the New Emerging Christian, the New Emerging Christian Kingdom and the Christian Right. Um, as Angie Hall, um, anthropologist at University of Chicago, pointed out last week at another panel for the book where we had more of a focus on Korean Christianity, um, the first three chapters deal with race or the racialization of evangelicalism. In the last two chapters, there's more of an emphasis on the so-called race for revival as in a competition. So the word race functions as a double entendre. Um, in the title and also thematically in the book. And um, it culminates in the last sentence of the book, um, which we also discussed at length last week, um, revival is not a race and one race does not have a monopoly on revival. This kind of relationship between revival and race is really important to the book um, and race, not only talking about racialization, but race as in a competition. So um, this is just a short brief um, in introduction to the book. Um, I think you'll hear more about it as we discuss it and as the panelists present their comments. Um, and I'm just so, so excited for our conversation today. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kim. Uh, now I would like to introduce the first uh, panelist, uh, Dr. Peter Choi who is the executive director of the Center for Faith and Justice in San Francisco and a member of the consortial faculty at the Graduate Theological Union in Berkeley. 
A historian of 18th century North America, Dr. Choi's areas of specialization include transatlantic revival religion, early evangelicalism, and world Christianity. He is the author of George Whitefield, Evangel Evangelist for God and Empire, and his next book project is tentatively entitled Subverting Faith, Early Evangelicals and the Problem of Race. Dr. Choi. Uh, thank you so much. It's really good to be here. I want to express my sincere thanks and congratulations to Helen for this great accomplishment of a book, uh, truly a groundbreaking contribution in so many ways. And my sincere appreciation to Dr. Kwak Quilon and the other panelists today. It's really good to be with you all. For my remarks, I'm going to focus on two main interventions I see the book trying to make. Surely there are more, but alas, only time for two. And both of these, I should mention at the outset, the book accomplishes with astounding success. So no suspense there. But I trust describing them in some detail, along with the implications and related questions that, that arise, will help us to appreciate the significant achievements of the book. Let me begin with two broad headings to talk about what I think the book is trying to do. Number one, it's showing us the promise of a trans-Pacific perspective for doing religious history. In this case, it's specifically the study of evangelicalism, but there are, of course, implications for how we study history and religion more broadly. Number two, it's showing us the problems that arise as Christianity moves across borders and oceans and cultures. Here I see the book building on the work of scholars in the history of Christianity and world Christianity in particular to problematize and enrich how we understand missions, conversion, and Christian faith itself. So the, pro the promise and problem. First, the promise of a trans-Pacific perspective. If American evangelicalism of the 20th century is to be understood by its major institutional expressions, World Vision, the BGEA, and Campus Crusade for Christ, and it turns out that those institutions were, not, were built not just by American evangelicals, but by Korean evangelicals. That's an enormous claim and a major twist in how we are to understand the history of evangelicalism going forward. The opening chapters of the book excel at showing us what's gained from a trans-Pacific perspective. By spotlighting the contributions of Korean evangelical actors like Billy Kim, Jun Gung Kim, and many, many more, the book provides convincing evidence called from primary sources and oral interviews, demonstrating another strength of the book, its use of diverse sources on both sides of the Pacific. Consider the first sentence of chapter one. World Vision is an organization that began with the idea of Kyung Chik Han. And then the last sentence of the same paragraph. Though Pierce, that is Bob Pierce, a name virtually synonymous with World Vision, carried greater national status as the representative from the big brother nation of the United States, Han, a pastor 12 years his senior, tutored Pierce in the business of evangelical humanitarian care. In this way, Kim forcefully challenges, and I'm quoting here, the myth that World Vision was created by one white man. Far from a naive celebration of Korean agency, however, the story of this book is much murkier. World Vision was built upon a troubling paradox, Kim writes. This nuancing and wrestling with the troubling paradoxes is what the book does so well throughout, pulling on threads, not merely to unravel the false or incomplete pictures we've inherited, but weaving new patterns to reveal a much more complicated picture. Examples of this kind of weaving or suturing to echo Kim's wonderfully vivid language abound throughout the book. Indeed, there is a surgical nature to the book. For example, descriptions of how militarized masculinity worked in concert with the racialized dimensions seen in the white soldier and the white Christ literally presented side by side as Billy Graham preached to American soldiers at a Korean war battlefront. We get detailed descriptions of how anti-Black prejudices went hand in hand with the model minoritization of Asians like Billy Kim at Bob Jones University. 
And perhaps the most moving and tragic chapter is in the middle of the book, where we have the story of white evangelicals helping and exploiting Korean orphans and non-orphan children presented as orphans. In all of these examples, the book has presented a method and a near flawless execution of that method, the promise of the trans-Pacific lens for understanding evangelicalism is clear. In the second half of the book, not just the promise, but the problem of trying to assess this border crossing religion becomes more prominent. Chapters four and five titled Revival and Explosion respectively, describe the growth of revival religion in Korea, the race for revival chronicled in these chapters. A central theme of the book, it is the title after all, is a race that shows Korean evangelicals outpacing American evangelicals in doing the work of revival. Korean evangelicals supersede, in other words, their American counterparts. More on this key word in just a moment. Not for the first time, Kim highlights the agency of Korean Christians who indigenize the faith they have received to advance their own aims in stoking revival. The process of indigenization has an underside, however. To describe the indigenizing principle, Andrew Walls has used the metaphor of Christianity as a prisoner of culture. And while there may be positive sides to the indigenization process of Christianity, the picture as a whole is much more ambiguous. And so it's not surprising that these chapters raise many complex questions. To be sure, it may be unfair to expect this book to answer all those questions. Helen is too careful a historian to offer cursory moralistic judgments. She prefers to let the historical agents and their actions speak for themselves. In fact, Kim further complicates the story by assiduous attention to historical context, one where changing dynamics in US-Korea relations responding to the developments in US-China relations and Nixon's evolving Cold War policies led to circumstances ripe for, of all things, trans-Pacific evangelical revival alongside hardening authoritarian rule, and eventually the formation of a trans-Pacific Christian right. In Kim's telling of the story, one might say revivalism and authoritarianism were co-constituted. It's a complicated, brilliant argument that I clearly can't do justice to here, but it's worth taking time to ponder in chapter four. Even after all of that, however, the problem of the Korean evangelical race for revival remains, along with some troubling questions. To what extent can we really describe Korean evangelical actions as evidence of their agency? Do we need more categories for fuller understanding? For instance, and as Kim herself suggests, could it simply be mimesis? as when Billy Kim went to great lengths to mimic Billy Graham. It's hard to deny, after all, that Korean evangelicals were beholden to their American counterparts, who themselves, pretty much since the beginning of their movement in the 18th century, longed for revival and engineered revival at every chance they got. And is not, and is not imitation the greatest form of flattery? At several points in the book, the reader encounters words like supersede and supersession as a way to describe the actions of Korean evangelicals. And here it's hard not to think of supersessionism as a theological error that arose in the age of encounter and European expansion, which according to Willie James Jennings becomes a vehicle for empire building and white supremacy. Jennings is not mentioned in the otherwise voluminous footnotes. Still, one can't help but wonder what are we to think of these Korean evangelical supersessionists in practicing cultural agent, oh, is practicing cultural agency worthy of valorization if it means the indigenous agent is merely repeating the patterns of their missionary teachers? Kim provides just enough detail to put us on the precipice of a judgment, but appears to stop short of an explicit critique. It's not necessarily a complaint. This willingness to persist with ambiguity and tension may actually be the genius of this book. But one reason why this issue stands out to me has to do with what the theologian Shoki Ko has said about Western Christianity's obsession with a cathedral mentality. With Ko in the background, Korean evangelical Christianity's fixation on the race for revival presents a puzzle. 
why were they so obsessed in seemingly Western or American fashion with building of both non-literal and later literal cathedrals? To conclude, far from a race toward glory, the Trans-Pacific Evangelical Race for Revival is depicted in the concluding sections of the book as spiraling towards authoritarian rule, systemic oppression, and American-style imperialism on Korean soil, an early version of what Yonggi Hong has called the McDonaldization of Christianity in Korea. In the end, it is not uh, an inspiring story, nor was it at the beginning or in the middle or any time for that matter. But it is a story very much worth telling. And Helen Jin Kim's book has done us an enormous service by helping us to be much more clear-eyed about all of it, warts and all. The very last thing I'll say is that Helen has written what may be the best concluding line of a book. It's certainly the best one-line homily I've heard in a long time. Revival is not a race. And one race does not have a monopoly on revival. Powerful soaring words at the end of an incredibly difficult, sorely needed, and undeniably important book. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Choi, for your very careful reading of the book and for your inspiring comments and also pointing to some future directions that researchers may pursue it and ponder. Now, our next panelist, uh, who will be uh, Dr. Christian Dubey, is Professor of History and Gender Studies at Calvin University. Her research focuses on the intersection of gender, religion, and politics. Her work has been featured in the New York Times, the Washington Post, NPR, and the BBC, among other outlets. Her most recent book is Jesus and John Wayne, How White Evangelicals Corrupted a Faith and Fractured a Nation. She's currently writing Live, Laugh, Love, A Cultural History of White Christian Womanhood. She has sent a pre-recorded video. I'm really glad to be able to talk today about Helen Kim's new book, uh, Race for Revival. I have to say that when I first heard that this book was going to be coming out, I was already thrilled because I felt like I was kind of bumping up against different aspects of what I thought um, was going to be part of this story. So I have been familiar through the work of David Swartz with the um, Korean origins of world vision. I was aware of Billy Graham's um, famous Korean crusade, a little bit about the, um, <clears throat> the orphan choir. Um, but more recently too, I've, I've seen the uh, kind of the growth in my own denomination, the Christian Reformed Church in Korean American congregations and have uh, interacted with a number of um, folks from those churches. And then more recently with the ascendancy to the presidency of the National Association of Evangelicals of Walter Kim, right? That sparked a lot of media attention, a lot of conversation. And in that conversation, it wasn't uncommon to come across arguments um, advanced by white evangelical leaders that Kim's presidency of the NAE was all the proof you needed that white evangelicals weren't white. <laughs> the heart of evangelicalism wasn't about being white. Um, and in fact, that race and racism was not at all central to the identity of white evangelicals or of evangelicalism more broadly. What better proof do you need than that we have Walter Kim here as president? And so I was, I was, bumping up against different parts of the story, but I had so many questions. So when this book came out, I was thrilled, not just by the scope uh, and the, the topics covered, but by the exquisite skill with which Helen undertakes this project. 
Um, the book exceeded my expectations in so many ways. Uh, first, it's a beautifully crafted book. Uh, the chapter titles, right? Martyr, Students, Orphan, Revival, Explosion. This is often uh, kind of, in, unless you're a writer and have really struggled to bring order to a disorderly story, you might miss how um, how well done it is when it is well done, right? It just brings such clarity, a kind of crispness to an otherwise um, potentially unruly narrative because there's so much going on here. Um, another thing this book does extremely well is it roots the um, analysis in real people, right? We meet so many characters in this story, but not an overwhelming number. Characters that bring us into uh, into the past that show us the human side of things that this is not just about uh, geopolitical developments or kind of big history of evangelicalism globally and in America it's about people's lives and I think that is done just incredibly well in this book um, she also poses questions very well to draw the readers, invite the readers into understanding early on in the narrative uh, what she's going to be talking about and why, um, why these questions matter. Um, so much to say here, so many uh, positives. I, um, I've also um, want to note that the research that went into this, right? I and mean, that's really the foundation here, just such solid archival research, oral histories, and that just throw, uh, shows through on every single page of the manuscript. I mean, that's how you get the people's stories. That's how you bring the human side into this. And that's how you get a well-crafted and deeply nuanced narrative. It's built on top of impeccable research. Finally, uh, I will say, I think this book is um, noteworthy for its exceptionally nuanced analysis. There's just so many examples, so many sentences that I was just putting big stars by uh, as I was reading all the way through that I thought, these are the exact right words, <laughs> the exact right words to, to present very complex ideas. And so um, I'm just gonna give you some examples of some of my favorites. And um, when I just started writing these down and kind of taking notes out of the book, I thought I'll just pull these for my, um, for my little talk and, and, and we'll be good to go. And then um, my favorite sentences and paragraphs, passages from the book ended up filling um, six pages single spaced. And so I needed to call that down. And I'm just gonna give a few examples here. Um, early on, she talks about how one must suture two parallel and otherwise disconnected stories. Suture two parallel and otherwise disconnected stories so beautifully drawn out. Piety and politics intertwined. Hardening evangelicalism on both sides of the Pacific into a religion of heart and hierarchy. Right? Just so crisp and so clear. She talks about how parachurches were key and how they expose the movement's DNA in terms of its structural foundation, boundary making work, and theological impulse. Right? As a historian of evangelicalism and trying to express this, this broader concept, I think, oh, that's, she has the words right there. Just so much is packed into those few evocative words. She writes about how these American evangelicals and South Korean Protestants traveled back and forth on this blood-stained highway with the dream of evangelizing the world, right? Never letting us forget that this, these broader themes, these bigger histories she's talking about, at the heart of the story is violence, right? Is political violence, is death, is suffering. And that, that is kept uh, in front of readers throughout the book. She also talks about um, how the modern U.S. evangelical empire was made on the route to U.S. Cold War expansion in Korea. And this hidden war story requires exhumation if we are to understand the full meaning of evangelical America. 
uh, her, her section, her chapter on the orphans, brilliant, how they helped listeners, especially white Protestants associated with the new evangelicalism to believe they espouse, that they could espouse racial democracy through individual financial donations, sponsorships, and the practice of humanitarianism. A real strength of this book is how these impulses, these intentions, this evangelism, how it fostered this trans-Pacific Christian um, relationship identity, right? But in a way that propped up authoritarian governments, that uh, was, um, right, there was a racist, racialized foundation here, and that even as Koreans participated in this, uh, they were propping up racial hierarchies and that had effects on American evangelicals, on uh, Americans more broadly, and on their own place in this broader world. All of which is to say, if this is a brilliant book, and I'm so grateful for this contribution. Thank you. I'm very grateful to uh, uh, Dr. Dewey for raising up the literary craft and also the writer's voice of Dr. Uh, Kim. And like her, when I was reading the book, I was very impressed by the combination of macro history and the oral narratives. Each vignette of those the interviews of people or stories uh, taken from the archives, they were so well chosen and so carefully and skillfully presented. Now, I would like to invite our third uh, panelist, uh, Mr. Thomas Seed. is a PhD candidate in religion and society at Princeton Theological Seminary. At the intersection of American history and religion, Tom's dissertation examines American missionaries and evangelists in Southeast Asia and Latin America who worked with the CIA during the Cold War. He argues that these collaborations expanded the reach of both American Christians and the CIA abroad and contributed to the world order that emerged in the Cold War's early decades. Mr. Seed. I am very grateful to Dr. Kwok Quilan, the Candler Foundry, and to those who organized this wonderful event and for the chance to discuss this book. It was even more trailblazing than I imagined. Uh, with each chapter, I found myself growing more excited, but also asking, how did I not know this before? I don't consider it an exaggeration to claim that Race for Revival is field-changing and even paradigm-changing. It makes clear that you can't understand U.S. evangelicalism or its Cold War rise without grasping how paramount Koreans have been to shaping evangelicalism after World War II. Race for Revival shows that evangelicalism's trans-Pacific ties are integral to evangelicalism's move into mainstream U.S. culture and its rapid spread abroad. Moreover, it demonstrates not only how evangelicalism's Cold War rise depended on racialized politics through which white evangelicals perpetuated white supremacy, but also how a trans-Pacific Christian right began to form. Each of these claims is groundbreaking, well-supported, and worthy of our attention, especially at this moment. Now, I want to take a few minutes to highlight some contributions and implications of this work that might take a back seat uh, to the book's main arguments, but are still noteworthy and significant. Uh, first, uh, some scholars have focused on how Christians have influenced governments. Fewer consider how governments use Christians, and fewer research South Korea in either context. Yet, Race for Revival does significant work here. It shows how South Korea's government benefited from and used trans-Pacific evangelical networks. In just two examples, uh, South Korea used Kim Che Khan's World Vision connection to, quote, bridge gaps with the Kennedy administration, end quote. And after South Korea came under fire internationally for suppressing religious liberty, even arresting left-leaning Christians, 
South Korea took advantage of uh, Expo 74, this massive evangelist, evangelistic event, uh, to make it seem otherwise. And I could go on. Yet Dr. Kim's work provides a framework through which we can better understand how South Korea's government used trans-Pacific evangelical ties for its own purposes. Uh, no one else has done this work, but it's right there in the book's background. And I'm already citing it. Uh, it's worth taking a moment to recognize and celebrate. Second, one nexus at which Race for Revival is situated is American religious history and world Christianity. And while not written primarily for world Christianity scholars, it makes important contributions to this field. When it came to Christianity spread, uh, some of the field's founders distinguished between the agency exerted by missionaries and new Christians. Missionaries could have complicated relationships to colonialism, yet Christianity was never simply a colonial tool for placating the masses. Rather, new Christians found meaning in their new religion and placed much agency into adapting European and US Christianities, taking them and making them their own. Scholars often value local agency above colonial politics and missionary motives and relationships to empires are often sort of set aside. And to this day, few world Christianity scholars study political power dynamics as being central to Christianity spread and few study U.S. roles in Christianity's Cold War spread. And this is where Race for Revival comes in. A central image in the book is Billy Graham, an evangelist from the U.S. empire, sharing a pulpit with Billy Kim, a South Korean Protestant leader. At an evangelistic crusade, they preached together to 1.3 million people whose agency drew in this crowd, U.S. evangelicals or Korean Christians. Is U.S. evangelicalism or world Christianity on display? And Dr. Kim's book offers complicated and sophisticated answers. One would not be possible without the other, and power dynamics between them were often unequal. Yet without studying either the politics or unequal power dynamics in Christianity's spread, layers of Christian agency, the sort that world Christianity scholars value, remain masked. If politics were not central to this book, we would not know that through revivals, South Korean Protestants like Jun Gan Kim exerted tremendous agency as Christians in challenging US exceptionalism, seeking to displace the US as the center of Christian power and reimagining their place in the world order. In fact, Dr. Kim shows that evangelicalism spread in Korea and its move into mainstream US culture cannot be understood apart from trans-Pacific Cold War politics. By revealing how much can be gained by focusing on agency that Christians exert in navigating the politics surrounding Christianity spread, Race for Revival can open up new ground for will Christianity scholars seeking to understand agency. I also wanna raise two other thoughts for possible discussion. Um, especially in the last five years, several U.S. evangelical histories have been written from transnational perspectives. Uh, for instance, Melanie McAllister's The Kingdom of God Has No Borders and David Schwartz's Facing West come to mind. In terms of method, world histories critics have long noted, by studying transnational encounters, histories of individual actors, movements, and nations can be given short shrift, flattened covered in less depth in order to capture transnational encounters among them. Uh, when scholars place U.S. Christianity into transnational frameworks in order to better understand U.S. Christianity, U.S. Christians often receive more attention than others, an approach that, like any other methodology, has advantages and disadvantages. And I lift this up in part because I think that Race for Revival reveals just how much can be gained by studying Christianity from transnational perspectives. It is by taking up this transnational focus that Dr. Kim has shown that post-World War II U.S. evangelicalism and its rise cannot be understood apart from its ties to Korea, and how the racialized politics of erasure that perpetuated white supremacy is integral to this history. And Dr. Kim does this in ways that do highlight how Korean Christians exercised creative agency, sometimes even bending U.S. evangelicalism uh, to their own purposes. And while I clearly think that Race for Revival makes a strong case for why scholars should write religious history from transnational perspectives, when it comes to writing about transnational encounters, there are always decisions to make about 
which perspectives to include and how to balance them. And I wonder what insights Dr. Kim or other panelists might want to offer on how to balance competing perspectives and historical scholarship. And further, this specific transnational lens helps us grasp how trans-Pacific ties have served as something of a connective tissue uh, between the Christian right in the US and in South Korea. And this seems especially timely and important for understanding our current moment. Uh, much has been written on white US evangelicals, especially after the 2016 election, and rightly so. Yet the US isn't the only nation in which Christians are embracing nationalism and anti-democratic politics. Uh, Right-wing Christians in Brazil support Bolsonaro. A number of Nigerian Pentecostals endorse Trump. Some work has been done on this, but not much, and very little research has been done on ties among these Christian groups. However, Dr. Kim's work uh, makes an important contribution here helping us to understand trans-Pacific Christian history uh, at this moment in which nationalism seems to be on the rise in multiple nations, Race for Revival offers insight into how and why nationalistic and anti-democratic politics among the respective Christian rights in two nations are intertwined. I wonder how Dr. Kim or others on the panel might view the significance of Race for Revival's work on the trans-Pacific right, its relevance for today, and the future of transnational studies regarding how the Christian right of various nations might be connected. To conclude, um, this book changes how we view US evangelicalism, its indebtedness to Korean Protestants, and evangelical uses of racialized politics. My hope is that so many race to read this book and professors to assign it, and even churches to discuss it, that its contents become common knowledge. Thank you, Dr. Kim. Thank you very much, Mr. Seed. I especially you appreciate you lift up the paradigm shift that is calling for in the book. Uh, because before we used to write American history and Korean history uh, in terms of their uh, religion and politics. But uh, Dr. Kim really invites us uh, to see the two as so interconnected in post-colonial language, the two histories are mutually inscribing each other. And if we read the history contrapuntally, we will see the overlap and also, uh, also the uh, uh, intersection between the two. So I appreciate uh, you lifting up and asking us, inviting us to think about the implications for today, that is the Cold War relations, uh, um, uh, what uh, it will be uh, of interest for looking at today's uh, world. And our final uh, panelist is Dr. Corey Ticker Price, who is a postdoctoral fellow uh, in the Society of Fellows in the Humanities at the University of Southern California. Her research and teaching focus on African-American history, religion and the American West, religion and media, and migration studies. Her current book project traces the historical and social forces that shaped the practices of African-American religious institutions in Southern California. Dr. Tucker Price. Hello, thank you so much for having me, Dr. Kim and my fellow panelists and Dr. Kwok Puiwan um, for this great opportunity to engage Dr. Kim's work. Dr. Kim, thank you for writing such a fantastic book. This book is groundbreaking in its approach. It's masterful in its storytelling and it's truly an eye-opening and refreshing read. And I honestly regret that we won't have a few hours to dissect your work. Before picking up this book, I was struck by the cover image of Billy Graham greeting Korean children. Without any additional information, the image conveys a well-known American preacher, evangelical ambassador, and entrepreneurial evangelist, as you rightly described him and others in your work. As he crouches down to get down to eye level, to greet these children. And then you read the title, 
Race for Revival, How Cold War South Korea Shaped the American Evangelical Empire. After reading your book, this image of Graham with the children is haunting. The additional context about the World Vision Korean Orphaned Choir, the children being used as, quote, shiny props to propagate an image of global evangelical humanitarianism, humanitarianism, end quote, the social isolation and the willful disregard for the effect this would have on the children. Looking at this picture again with this additional context, with this new information, it speaks to one of the last sentences in your book a warning to, quote, move away from constantly rehearsing a past that continues to haunt with no resolution, end quote. The image is haunting, the title is haunting, and as I was reading, I couldn't help but think of this transformative period in the U.S. and in global history, where the nuclear arms race and the space race are occurring in the background at the same time, as we now understand a race for revival was also occurring. This book amplifies how others uh, in the panel have also discussed how important a trans-specific and trans-historical study of religion is to our understanding of American evangelicalism and other religious movements and ideas. I think of Sylvester Johnson's work and his call within African-American religions to think about how the story of African-American religion and American religion cannot be contained by the time and space of the United States. Dr. Kim's framing here is generative because it allows us to think through a multifaceted historical lens that acknowledges the contributions of Koreans who transformed American evangelicalism, but also how they sought to invest in their own empire of spirit. I was struck by the fact that this history was hidden, whether in plain sight or due to a lack of access in terms of translating sources and archival trust. And I wonder what the erasure of Koreans' contributions to the transformation of American evangelicalism during the Cold War era means for the field and how scholars of religion and historians might think about source material and translation. In other words, how can more narratives like yours be brought to the fore? Another important aspect of your work is the role of death in war and misremembering myth-making in historical narratives. The narrative about world vision and its development is eye-opening. I pondered who does this myth serve and how does it secure an origin story that bolsters a particular understanding of American evangelicalism? What is the function of this myth and how we think about empire, religion, and race? I think about Zorono Hurston here. The truth telling is in the lie. The lie allows us to think about the unstable nature of whiteness and the unstable nature of American evangelicalism. And in Dr. Kim's work, we see how she treats instability. The role of death and violence in shaping American evangelicalism. This particularly becomes clear in the martyr chapter as it relates to how we think about conversion narratives and the role of suffering and how important personal conviction was to how people thought about embracing this religion due to their suffering. Something that was also very eye-opening for me was the term racial intertial territory. <laughs> it's a tongue twister. <laughs> and in my own work, uh, thinking about um, ethnic and racial groups, I often migrated to a racial triangulation understanding of the dynamics between Black, Asian, and white communities and how they're pitted against each other in particular political arenas and um, in American political theater. And what I so appreciated about your work is that there is a clear difference here. And it becomes clear that these binaries are not as neat as we think they are and that you're opening up a new pathway for us to think about nuance. And I'm going to quote something that you wrote in the book. Quote, the Korean War also prompted the second wave of Korean immigration to the United States, where South Korean students forged new networks with white fundamentalists through institutions of higher education in the Jim Crow South and Southern California, namely Bob Jones University, Fuller Theological Seminary, and Campus Crusade. Inhabiting a racially intertestial position is a primarily Black and white racial hierarchy 
Jung Gong Kim and Billy um, Hong Kim's conversion narratives as student immigrants bridged effective gaps between the Cold War United States and non-communist Asians in alignment with Eisenhower's Cold War emphasis on US Asian integration. Through the costly racial logic of Korean integration, these Christian students' narratives portrayed an image of racial equality in a liberal democracy, even as those American fundamentalist and neo-evangelical institutions maintained a system of racial inequality in which Black students were excluded and Koreans were divided into good and bad racialized categories. The nuance here uh, for me and I think for other scholars who are working on race and religion and how we think about um, how we can dissect sort of this racial formation process that happens within the United States. This opens up an entirely new frame to consider the dynamic issues related to race and how racial formation takes place not only through a domestic frame, but through a trans-Pacific scope. And in particular, how that tends to change, move and shift depending upon where people are located within US boundaries. Dr. Kim, your book, I could go on and on, um, but it allows us to think about religion in a more expansive and deep way. And you allow us to think about race as part, part of a larger framing and how we construct our narratives as it relates to American religion and as it relates to how we think about religion as it moves beyond and within borders. So thank you so much for this important work and I look forward to engaging in the conversation. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Pecker Price. Uh, I just pick up what you said, Miss Memory, Myth, and Origin Story. Asking those questions really hits at the heart of the question, the vocation of a historian and a mm -hmm. theologian. What we, cho you, we choose to study, to remember, to present to the larger audience, what matters. And I appreciate you uh, bringing uh, all these uh, nuances uh, in, the, uh, in, in the book uh, forward for our uh, pondering and also uh, sharing with us uh, the deeply embedded history of religion and race from African American uh, perspectives. And now I call upon uh, Dr. Helen Kim to uh, briefly respond before opening up to the larger conversation. Okay, uh, thanks Dr. Kwok. And first, I'm just so blown away by all your comments and questions, um, critiques, and I'm just so grateful. Um, I'm so glad we're recording this because I, I need to, I'm gonna go back, listen to the, just soak it all in. Um, just so, so um, grateful. Um, yes, thank you so much, Corey. Thank you so much, Tom. Thank you so much, Peter and uh, Dr. Kwok for moderating. And also thank you so much, Kristen, um, for sending your video in advance. Um, I'll just go ahead and um, start with Corey, Tom, Kristen, Peter, just respond that way. And if we have some time, maybe you all can respond too. Um, although I know we do want to do Q&A as well. Um, but just starting um, with your comments, Corey, I think the words haunted and hidden are key words for the book. I mean, race, revival go together, but haunted, hidden absolutely go together. This is this is a this is a haunted and haunting story. <laughs> and um, the image of the book, um, I think, displays that. And it's so funny because um when I first started my research I always thought a different image was going to be at the cover of the book actually um um an image from chapter four of the revival and all of that and actually um the BGEA um didn't let me have the copyrights to use it as the cover of the book <laughs> so then I said what's what's another image that I think really captures the essence of the book and it was this one at the heart of chapter three. And then actually, since the book has been published, so many people have been talking about chapter three, the orphan choir and how that's such a haunted story. 
and it's also a hidden story. Um, you know, the whole origins um, of World Vision, you know, that David Schwartz and I have both worked on, but I think the hidden and the haunted aspects of it have to do with war, it has to do with race, it has to do with violence. And it has important historiographical implications, as you note, that I think um, to your point about sources and misremembering who does, who does um, these myths serve, um, I think just in doing the archival research and all, it just, what I realized was that we just don't first have, have all of the data. Right, so if we're only using archives on one side of the Pacific, um, we just don't have the other side of the story. So that was just a great benefit to be able to go to Korea to do the archival research there to realize Korean orphan choir members, some of them are still alive, you know, and so then I could interview them, do the oral history and hear how they thought about their experience. And that's how I had the archival data in Southern California from World Vision about Peanuts, who's on the cover, um, Sang Young Kim here, um, see him, this, this guy. <laughs> um, and he, in the archival data, he's, it's, it says he commits suicide and has this critique of World Vision. But I needed to confirm that when I went to Korea and I did the oral history with the woman who's right next to him, Ji Young Oh, or Oh Ji Young, and she, just unprompted in the oral history talked about him. And so that's the sources. This is just to point out, because the point about your sources, we have to think expansively about our archival sources, um, be willing to push ourselves to actually travel to get those sources. Um, also insist that, you know, overlook sources matter. Um, and, and and in some cases, you know, think about that. Why don't why can't I do the oral history? You know, um, that can that that's a perfectly fine way to expand the data. But nobody has actually asked them what their opinion was, right? Um, so that and I think that's why you know it's it's a hidden story because of the archival access and all of that. But it's I think it's also hidden because it's haunted. Um, it's an uncomfortable story to tell. Writing that chapter three was very difficult. I remember my dissertation committee saying, you know, this sounds like a form of exploitation. Can you say more about that? Um, can you also say more about race? And just pulling those threads, um, you know, from that point um, into the editing of the book and the final edits, all of that. It's just once you start unraveling that kind of haunted or hidden narrative, it's there's just no turning back. <laughs> and I think it does expose certain lies that we've told ourselves about um, about the past. And um, this is a story of exuberance. There's a lot of joy in it and a lot of excitement, but there's so much sadness also and tragedy. And um, I think to tell the the truthful story is to tell all, all of those dimensions. Um, and that does get to um, the point about race as well, is that it, that second chapter, Korean integration, the students are going to Bob Jones and, oh, it's just, that was really hard to study, seeing Billy Kim and looking at the albums and um, just all the Orientalism and their investment in uh, racial segregation and specifically black exclusion all at the same time that they're trying to uplift Billy Kim as kind of this poster child for their educational program. It just all those layers um, I wanted to unpack and it, it's to me that's also an exemplifies kind of a hidden and, and haunted true haunted story um, and looking back at, at that data. Um, yeah, so this is all to say, um, thank you for your comments. And I, I just hope that our field, especially kind of this Pacific turn and also with your work and kind of focus on the West, just that we expand kind of the geographical reach of our stories, but also therefore to challenge ourselves to say, 
this is going to challenge extant narratives that we have about the past. And some of it's going to be very uncomfortable. Um, some of it's going to be haunted. Um, and um, but but we have to we have to tell the stories. Um, OK, um, to Tom. Um, yeah, thank you so much for kind of highlighting the ways in which kind of the relationship between politics and religion you know, the Korean government's use of Korean Christians and pitting kind of evangelicals against liberationists is kind of a story that's known to a lot of theologians and sociologists, but the transnational dimensions to that are relatively unknown. And I wanted to expose <laughs> those dimensions and, and to talk about um, you know, how, you know, Billy Kim is not only working with the Park regime, um, an authoritarian regime, but also then how Billy Graham gets incorporated into that and, and how that network goes all the way back to the Korean War and, and all these other networks with Campus Crusade and uh, World Vision. And I, it was so surprising to find in the archives that all three of those organizations were at that revival. I just, I didn't know that. When I started the project, I started with Campus Crusade. I had no idea that, and then I did World Vision and BGE, and I had no idea until I went into the archives that all three of them were there in 1973 at the Kim Graham Crusade. And it's this, this, just yeah, the transnational dimensions kind of really open. I think that story because it's usually told very much kind of nationally, um, and. This whole piece about world Christianity and agency and its relationship to politics, I think um, this kind of ties into some of what also Peter is talking about. Um, but yeah, world Christianity as a field has really highlighted agency and there's a kind of real promise and potential in the field for kind of, you know, not just seeing kind of non-Western or indigenous Christians as just inexorably duped or um, just as victims of empire and colonialism. And I think that has really helped me to be able to see, to see all of my historical characters as full-fledged historical characters, right? Um, and, and that for me was important because I think what agency and kind of thinking about non-Western historical um, agents as full-fledged agents means is that you don't get to romanticize them see because once you treat them as full historical characters you see the good the bad and the ugly <laughs> right and I think that in my book that's what you see I, I just didn't want us to see the Korean Christian fig I first I wanted to overcome the invisibility and the hiddenness that Corey's talking about because they're just there on the edges and Kristen was talking about she keeps bumping up into this narrative and same with me it's just they're always there but it's like you grasp they're like ghosts <laughs> like you grasp them can't really but your hands can't reach out to them and um I wanted to yeah exhume that narrative so um but but when you when you then treat them as full historical characters I, I wanted to resist the impulse to romanticize them. So that's why Kyung Ji Khan, I talk about him, um, you know, as squarely, you know, the founder or co-founder of World Vision and all the data that um, along with Schwartz's work really proves that point. But I also wanted to show how his relationship to these evangelical institutions was really complicated. Right, and by the time you get to chapter three, you see how he is not seeing the full picture, right, and is um, working with Pierce and the Orphan Choir, and um, I think it's just this incredible humanitarian impulse that he also had, um, but that could have miss. Also, there's a there's a miss um, a lack of clarity in terms of his own sight there um, in terms of what American Christianity could really offer Korean Christians and Korean children. The potential, I think he oversaw the potential 
you know, overreach in terms of potential. And look, that's a hard, that's a hard story to tell because if, if you're a Korean Christian, even today, or even thinking historically about this period, um, Han is a valorized Christian figure. <laughs> so, um, you know, to talk, I, it, you know, um, but I wanted to be able to see him in his full complexity. So, and that's where the politics comes in, like you're talking about. Um, with, in terms of um, the Christian right, I really hope, um, my book goes to 1980, but I really hope that other scholars, and maybe I'll also pick up some of this on my next project, but I really hope that um, other scholars will delve even more into this. Um, I wanna name at least um, Nami Kim's work and also um, Jane Hong's work. Uh, Jane Hong Lee's work because Nami Kim's work on hegemonic masculinity and Korean evangelical Protestantism is working kind of in a later period, even more contemporary. And she's kind of thinking about the Korean context and the formation of a Protestant right. But I'd love to see in, you know, past 1980, even up to this present moment, how that Christian right um, gets further strengthened um, through a Pacific lens. So taking something like her book and then expanding it into the American context and maybe some other trajectories too. Um, and into kind of a 1980 to maybe 2022 20, or 21st century kind of perspective. I'd love to see how that expands because it does continue. Last week when we um, had the other book panel, uh, one of the Korean missionaries who was on the panel talked about um, the Tegaki movement uh, or Tegaki Bude um, and how they're uh, very much tied to kind of Korean right politics, but they're really bringing in kind of American conservatism also into their politics. And so there's just so much more to say there about Korean and American Christian nationalism that I think I hope other scholars will continue to work on. And I think um, with Jane Hong Lee's work on Asian and American evangelicals, I really hope to, you know, see how she's going to think about what is, you know, into the 80s, into the 90s, and maybe even into the 21st century, how are Asian American evangelicals impacted by this longer history of a forging of a trans-Pacific Christian right? I mean, to some extent, they're influenced, still influenced by it, as I talk about in the conclusion, but to some extent, they're also trying to work against it, right, create a different kind of movement. So um, I think that's all to say there's more, more to be done there. Um, so yes, thank you so much. So much more to talk about also with your work on, on the Cold War. Um, to Kristen and then to Peter's comments, I'll just say that um, I really appreciated Kristen's and also Dr. Kwok, what you're talking about with um, the actual writing or the construction of the book. Um, but also she talks about how Walter Kim, has, even now, you know, he's the president of the NAE, National Association of Evangelicals, and that's often by white, white evangelicals seen as a way to kind of create a narrative that evangelicalism, to excuse kind of the racial politics of evangelicalism, to say, okay, here we have kind of this, kind of a token, a tokenized racial um, trope that they may use to um, to kind of excuse the racism in the movement or tradition. And that that is the kind of history that I want to expose in this book is to say that, look, it, it putting Walter Kim out there as the president of NAE, I think is too late because Koreans were part of the very formation. If you look at my book, the Koreans were part of the formation of American evangelicalism. So, so to in the 21st century, then to say you have a Korean American as the head, it's already that's a that's that's um that's a misremembering, <laughs> and it's a it's buying also into the the haunted and the hidden aspects of the story, which is that Koreans were there from the 50s. So, I think we should we need to look at that. Um, and to Peter, 
I have appreciated so much our conversations about American evangelicalism and race and world Christianity and agency. And this is this is a point that I wrestle with a lot. I wrestle with it, you know, from the very beginning. And um, I want to say two things about this. First is that um, in this book, I wanted to highlight um the historical agency of all the characters american and korean and otherwise um in those as i mentioned the good the bad and the ugly right but i wanted to be able to be for sure that the korean christians you could see what they were doing because it's again addressing the hiddenness the invisibility and also this whole, you know, even with Dume's book, there's a whole reckoning that happens with her book, Jesus and John Wayne. But you can't have a reckoning unless you know who you're reckoning with. <laughs> and she names like Mark Driscoll and John Piper and all of that. And I just so, so much in reading uh, modern American evangelical history, I just thought, well, I don't even know who the people are. <laughs> right. I just have a sense they're there. But who's controlling things on the Pacific side of the story? And then that that led me to Billy Kim and Kyung Ji Khan and and then to the kind of um, also the children. Um, so I think that's part of the agency move. Um, but one thing I want to say is that in my book, at least, agency does not equate freedom. So the characters are agentive, but you know, so let's just talk about the Korean Christian side. They're agentive, they're they're constructing things, they're making huge churches, they're making huge revivals, they're calling Billy Graham, they're you know, using the government and to make their revivals real. Um does that does that lead to their freedom? I mean, by the end of the book, you know, I don't think so. I mean, to them, from their perspective, yes, a certain kind of freedom, especially in terms of spiritual freedom, and also potentially, I think Han um, really, you know, believes in. I think actually, all three of the main male pastors, I think, believe that their work of revivalism can lead to maybe um, the nation's freedom, but does it actually lead to their political freedom? Um, my answer is no. And that's the problem. So I, the kind of agency and freedom, I think, have to go in tension. Um, that's the kind of ambiguity and tension that I want to show, especially those last couple of chapters. And I'll just offer this other piece up too. Um, what you're talking about is uh, last week, the term global model minority came up. So can we think about the Korean Christians that I'm discussing in this book as a kind of global so taking the trope of the model minority, that's a kind of a domestic narrative, but then thinking about them global as global model minority. Um, that's um, a, that's something that Angie brought up, really playing on this, the tying race for revival, both meanings and um, kind of tying that together. Another person in the audience, Jenny Wang Medina, a professor here at Emory in Korean literature and culture said, Korean, South Korean Christians potentially thinking of them as a Cold War model minority. That was another um, phrasing that she used. So yeah, that's to say that I think there's something there, right? That the book is lifting up. Um, so yeah, um, a lot to discuss further there too. Yeah. Thank you so Thank much. You much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Kim. Uh, for your response. Now I would like to open uh, to the uh, participants joining the Zoom room so they can ask their questions or offer their comments. And you can do that either posting your questions or comments in the chat, or you can raise your hand. There is a button of uh, reactions at the bottom of the screen. You, if you click that, you can also raise your hand and then I'll call upon you to uh, speak. While we are waiting for the uh, questions, 
I think for the benefit of uh, those joining us who are uh, doing research or in archives. And I would like just to ask uh, uh, Dr. Kim, if you can comment on, if you when you go to the archive, um, did you take a lot of notes? Can you just share with us a little bit about the process of research since there's so much data and material? Yeah, um, I think archival research is both exciting and also a painstaking process for me. So yeah, I take I'm taking copious notes. It depends. Um, sometimes, so I'll have kind of two approaches. One is that I go into the archive and I'm reading and taking copious notes on the materials. And I use Evernote to take my notes and then to catalog everything and categorize. I, th I found Ed Evernote really effective because you could search very quickly as well. Um, alternatively, sometimes if I don't have enough time to do all that reading, what I'll do is I'll just take pictures of everything. And that's also really challenging work too, you know. So I take the pictures and then take all of the notes um, by hand. Usually I try to... Um, I'll have like a notebook where I'm taking notes by hand because that helps me remember the material. Um, Thank you. But yeah. You. Yes, we have uh, Karis Wu who uh, wants to speak. Yeah. Hi, Karis. Yeah. Uh, yes, hello. I'm sorry that my camera's not on, uh, but first of all, I just wanted to thank you and the comment, uh, the respondents for such an insightful uh, conversation. I was definitely taking copious notes um, through through this past hour too. Uh, my question, uh, I hope that it articulates and comes across well, but I'm thinking um, there are so many interventions as we've all identified of what this book is doing, um, interventions that resonate really strongly with me about trans-Pacific lenses um, and approaches to American religious history and just all the different, uh, I love what you said about how agency does not equate freedom. I think that's a phrase I will be taking with me and thinking about a lot and incorporating into my own work. Um, but I'm because of all the, because of the necessity of this spanning work and thinking of all the different audiences that it addresses or that need this um, and that we want to be talking, that you'd want to be talking to through this, whether it's um, thinking about, I guess, who's considered the normative US evangelical um, different populations who were excluded from that uh, population of U.S. evangelical. And then um, I'm thinking in particular of Korean American evangelicals. And there's just so many people who um, need this information, but it's the challenge is to try to think of how to communicate it when that task feels so immense under multiple tasks at hand. So I just wanted to um, ask you a bit of what kinds of audiences um, if you were thinking of particular audiences as you were putting this together, how you calibrate this maybe when you talk to different people um, and yeah, the challenges and the successes and the hopes that you have in, um, in communicating this in a really challenging way to the multiplicities of people in the U.S. and then also in the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for your comments and questions, Karis. Um, so the four fields are different in terms of audience, historians of American religions, historians of Christian, Korean Christianity, even anthropologists or theologians. Um, and then also it, anybody working on Cold War in Asia, especially in Asian studies and Asian American studies. So it is at the intersection of a lot of um, fields. I wanna speak to all of them <laughs> and have been as much as possible trying to speak to all of them. And in terms of um, non-scholarly audiences, um, it's interesting because I um, presented, one of the first places I presented in my book in April was at Fuller. And they were having a conference on Korean immigrant churches. And I presented chapter two um, of the book students, immigration, conversion, white fundamentalism. And my respondent there was um, a pastor of a Korean immigrant megachurch in Southern California. So a Korean American evangelical. And um, he responded to me in Korean and he knows this history. He's a transnational, he's an immigrant. So he knows the figures in chapter two. He knows basically 
if you're a Korean or a Korean immigrant Christian, you know all these figures like Billy Kim, Jung Kun Kim, Kyung Jae Khan. You might not know Oh Ji Young because um, she's lesser known, the orphan choir. But the but the male pastors are very well known. So yeah, um, that was one way to access an audience where um, he might not be at the AAR that kind of thing, but he was able to we had a really good conversation and he was talking about how the history of anti-communism makes it really difficult for him as a pastor and for other Korean and Korean immigrant pastors to talk about social justice. He understands it's like the impact of this history, even today in Southern California at his mega church, which had been actually growing during the pandemic. Um, how, and, and, and he talked about it also um, in terms of social justice, also in terms of talking about gender equality within the church, um, how that how this this history is a kind of continues to haunt <laughs> immigrant churches, right? And does structure both possibilities and um, limitations. And then the that in that particular instance, the audience there were scholars, but also other pastors, Korean pastors and then I think they were also um, live streaming it to other kind of Korean speaking audiences because they had it um, subtitled and all of that so that's just to say that I only hoped that the book would reach not only academics but also you know practitioners and that's I guess what's been happening <laughs> so um you know I think about what are, what's next is something we have to talk about as you know a larger community but at least I hope that this is bringing um, a new dimension of the conversation but also kind of reigniting an old conversation thank you very much other comments and questions uh, yes, uh, Sanko uh, Kwang. Yes, uh, can you hear me? Okay, thank you for everyone and especially for inspiring questions and comments uh, to panels. And my question might not clearly fit into your book panel, but uh, because my concern is related to after 1997 in South Korea uh, historical event, Personally, I'm interested in uh, how you are considering this connection with economic uh, relationship between United States and Korean South Korea, because mm -hmm. uh, after the financial crisis that happened in A East Asia, including South Korea, in the late 20th, 20th century, the economy became one of the most critical factors in deciding the relationship between Asian countries and United States, regardless of the fact that they are aligned with the United States or not. Plus, more specifically, in 1997, South Korea experienced the most disastrous financial crisis throughout the history. Although some Korean people bust up the miracle of Han Lieber, given that they overcame the financial crisis in uh, 2002, but meanwhile, neoliberal economic principles were transplanted into South Korea by IMF, Economy Society, and even Korean Protestantism was significantly influenced by that kind of principles. So my concern is about uh, Korean Protestantism's tendency that they want to become a bigger and mega church than ever before. So they actually became more similar to big corporations. So some understand this tendency as a pathological sign, which means the emergency of emergence of megachurch after 1997 is not one happening, but a phenomenon of a megachurch. So in megachurches, uh, franchising, so establishing a uh, branch churches in other areas and also uh, showing off their senior pastor's leadership as uh, the, the spirit of an entrepreneur. 
and also the the polarization of wage between the senior pastor and associated ones. So in this sense, I'm wondering how uh, and what do you think about the colonial economic influence uh, of on South Korean Protestantism and evangelicalism? Mm -hmm. Well, thanks for your question um, and comments, Sungu. And to me, it sounds like this is the project you all you ought to work on. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because this is this, already these reflections are, I think, really rich. And I think making those connections will be it'll be really interesting to see how you make those. Um, so this is, you know, the economic development history is is so important to the Cold War narrative 50 to 80 that I'm writing about. Um, but I will say in this book, religion, politics, and race are kind of foregrounded. So for my next book, um, I am working on another trans-Pacific project where I'll foreground religion, gender, and economics. So the subtitle is Gender, Gender Spirit, and Prosperity in the Pacific. So I'm trying to bring those themes, um, tie those themes together um, in this trans-Pacific frame. And there was that was a dimension that I thought is there, but um, probably need a whole other project to explore. Um, I think what you're saying, I mean, part, but part of it is, you know, even into the 1990s and the 21st century, uh, you're talking about the connections between neoliberalism and Korean Protestantism and its connections to the megachurches. Um, that history, though, interestingly enough, is rooted in the Korean War context, insofar as the first megachurch that's ever founded in Korea is by Kyung Jae Khan, right? In the and it starts in that with the migration of his church from the north to the south. You know, and so it becomes the largest Presbyterian church in the world, um, but then also the first Korean megachurch. And so I do think we have to look back at Han's church and kind of in the, not only the political dimensions and the dimensions of war um, that he's working in, but also then how that sets a certain kind of economic way of thinking about church growth. Um, you know, that I think you could tie the nineties back to the fifties, kind of do that longer history. So even if you were to work on a more theological or ethical project um, that's more contemporary, exploring these themes, I think having at least a chapter in there about the longer history of the Korean megachurch and its connections to capitalism, um, I think would be really, really important. Yeah. Thank you. Because of time, we will have only one more comment or question. I would like to invite Ban Dang. Uh, thank you so much. This is so uh, enriching. And I think some of the uh, the questions that I was thinking also, it's already also some of them is cover. And um, I would uh, like, I would like to hear more uh, when you do the research or engaging with this um, uh, women who are uh, have um, like uh, interview with uh, women for their resources and different uh, meeting with different people like in Korea or how the Korean Christians um, like the differences respond or the diver diversity of the Christian, Korean Christian, can you talk um, a little bit more of that. Yeah, yeah kind of the diversity of Korean Christians, but also um, in working with the women who I interviewed. Yeah, so one thing I'll say about this book is that um, we shouldn't look to this book as the, the book that tells all of the history of Korean Christianity. <laughs> and I think there's a way in which in the Western Academy, we put so much weight on the non-Western or non-white stories to tell everything. Um, but this is a very much a partial story. It's like one 
important story that I think needs to be told, but it's one story. And so, you know, when I go back to Korea, you know, my family doesn't, my, my uh, eldest uncle, uh, eldest uncle's family, they don't worship in a mega church. They almost never connect with mega churches. They're in this very, very small church that has nothing to do really, you know, with the exact history that I'm talking. So there's just so much diversity there, theological diversity and all of that. Um, so that's just to say, I think for that, we should look at, you know, like the encyclopedias on Korean religions to tell us the religious diversity of Korean Christianity um, and Korean religion in general. But yeah, this this book is really focusing on the evangelical narrative. And I would like to see a project in the future where, because I do talk about, you know, um, liberationists who are emerging at this time, how they're interacting with the evangelicals in a transnational frame. Because even the liberationist narrative has been told in the kind of the Korean or Asian context. Um, and then a bit how it's connected to America and other countries. But then how do those, even, how does the evangelical transnational and then also liberationist transnational story interconnect, intersect, right? That's something that I would really like to see, um, including, um, you know, if we were to put a focus on women or even feminist theologies and how they're migrating during this period transnationally too would be really important to study. So this is just kind of, for me, I think of it as just kind of getting us off the ground with a trans-Pacific paradigm and thinking about late 20th century um, history, but I really hope it's not, it's not the end. And um, that's why also in the next book, I do want to focus more on women and gender um, because yeah, there's just, there's just so much more to say there. And I'm going to be doing more oral histories with women. I think because of the silence of the archives, the gendered silence of the archives, use of oral histories is a really important way to access those voices. Yeah. Thank you very much for writing this book, Raised for Revival. We are certainly looking forward to your second book and your future scholarship. Uh, please join me in thanking all the panelists who are joining us uh, today, and I would like to thank the participants for joining uh, this uh, particular book uh, event uh, for your participation, and I look forward to uh, seeing you in other future uh, events of Kendra Foundry. Goodbye.